You're listening to the Mutual Audio Network. Unless you're tasting it. In which case, I think you're doing it wrong. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Soul Twin Audios. Stories created solely with the vintage soul in mind. The thoughts and opinions regarding dark shadows and strange paradise are my own. While I might express a dislike for a certain segment from either soap, you will not hear me bashing any actor on either series or completely trashing any of the storylines. My aim is to be as respectful and professional as possible, as I know fans can get very personal about their favorites. Please keep this in mind if you leave a comment on YouTube or one of the other platforms for this podcast. Night has fallen upon the great estate, and yet the occupants within lie restless, plagued with their own dark secrets, and longing for a paradise beyond their reach. Is this Collinwood, in the year 1897, or is it Mel Jardin in 1969? Join me as I explore the beginnings of two very distinct gothic soap operas. One with a well-known fan base, while the other has nearly fallen into obscurity. I bid you welcome to my dark paradise. Next stop, Collinsport. Next stop, Collinsport. What? There's no one here to greet me? I suppose that means a vampire is going to bite me, or or worse, a werewolf will jump out of the shadows and grab me. Then maybe a family curse will... Oh, wait, it's the early days of the gothic soap. No need to be alarmed yet. I'll just step into this mostly deserted diner. No one will bother me. What'll it be? Uh, yeah. Could you give me a copy of Art Wallace's Shadows on the Wall? Hmm. I'll see if we have a copy of that in the back. Uh, thanks. It began with a dream. In September of 1964, the ABC network aired two series which featured gothic or supernatural elements. Bewitched, starring Elizabeth Montgomery as that nose-twitching witch Samantha who struggled to give up her powers to become an ordinary suburban housewife, and Dick York portraying her often frustrated yet devoted husband. The show also featured old-time Hollywood star Agnes Moorhead as Samantha's mother and Dora, who was constantly trying to get her daughter to continue her use of witchcraft while loathing Dogwood, er, uh, Darren, in his role of preventing her of just being who she was. And there's that delightfully creepy, kooky, mysteriously spooky family who lived in a big gothic mansion on Cemetery Ridge, the Adams Family. Now, this family was in direct contrast to ABC's wholesome Leave It to Beaver. In characters of married couple Morticia and Gomez, along with their children Pugsley and Wednesday, it's my understanding that they are human beings with an intense love of all things macabre and possibly do have supernatural abilities, but the specifics on that is unknown. Their butler, Lurch, has incredible strength, and their pet hand, Thing, is known to sort of teleport from place to place. It is my belief that both shows had a significant impact in paving the way for Dan Curtis to pitch his literal dream to ABC. 
The concept of his dream was a simple one. A beautiful dark-haired woman traveling by train was headed into a town she was not familiar with to become a governess to a young boy. She arrives at the train station, but when she steps off the train, the station is empty, with no one waiting for her. That's it. Thank you. Shadows on the Wall is the title of the Bible for the daytime television series which was ultimately called Dark Shadows. When it debuted on June 27, 1966 on ABC TV, the treatment consists of character descriptions and storyline projections written by Art Wallace. Certain characters and stories from the Bible were changed by the time Dark Shadows went into publication. In addition, some proposed story elements were discarded altogether. Art Wallace writes as his premise, this is the story of Victoria Winters, of the immediate search for her identity and her unending search for her sense of self. It is a story of that impulse we all have to know ourselves, to understand our drives, our needs, our failings. It is a story of suspense and passion, of terror and turbulent romance, of dark threats and endless yearnings. It is a story that plunges into a gothic world swirling with love, fear, hate, revenge, and the relentless mystery of the unknown. It is a story of a romance struggling to survive and the ferocious whirlpool of emotions that ceaselessly cast their fascinating shadows on the wall. After reading the 91-page Bible, which I purchased on eBay many years ago for nearly a hundred dollars, I was really intrigued by what didn't make it into the series. The question, of course, on every fan's mind is, who were Victoria Winter's parents? Because, of course, this wasn't resolved after Alexandra left the series. Wallace writes, it is a deeply moving, highly emotional sequence as Elizabeth tells Vicky that she is not Vicky's mother, as Vicky had obviously suspected. She doesn't know who Vicky's mother is, but she does know that Paul was her father. I would have loved to have seen this played out. I know there are a lot of fans out there who will disagree with me and say that Vicky was, in fact, Liz's daughter, possibly with either Bill Malloy or Ned Calder. But to me, that's just obvious and predictable. And yes, I'm aware of Jameson Selby's audio play, Return to Collinwood, where it was expressed that Victoria is the daughter of Elizabeth, but I prefer to think of Mr. Selby's work as his interpretation, fan fiction. Another huge change in the Bible was the fact that Roger Collins was supposed to die. Yes, he was so paranoid about Vicky and what she was up to with Burke Devlin, and so convinced that the two of them were conspiring against him that he tried to kill her on Widow's Hill, but ended up falling to his death instead. It would have definitely ended up as a different series, that's for sure, but to me, it still holds a lot of interest. If you don't have a copy of Shadows on the Wall, you could try finding it on eBay like I did, or possibly track it down through Pomegranate Press, maybe even MPI. Shadows on the Wall is an excellent Bible, because it really gives the foundation of what Dark Shadows became. While it doesn't have the vampires and the witches and the ghosts right away, you can still tell that it's rooted in its gothic nature and all-around creepy atmosphere. The Arrival of Victoria Winters my journey is beginning. A journey that will bring me to a strange and dark place. To the edge of the sea. To a house called Collinwood. She'll work out very well, I'm sure. Doing what? Holding my little son's hand? Comforting you when the shutters creak? With all our ghosts, we don't need any strangers in this house. The Collins family's the biggest thing in this town. They own the biggest cannery, the biggest fishing fleet, and the biggest, darkest, gloomiest old house. <laughs> You make it sound like some old English novel. Rattling chains, ghosts in the corridor. Elizabeth Collins Stoddard hasn't left that hill in 18 years. Now, personally, I think she needs a keeper. Perhaps she's getting one. <laughs> like who? You? No, a girl. A girl who doesn't know what she's getting herself into. Welcome to the beginning and the end of the world, Miss Winters. The pilot episode starred veteran film actress Joan Bennett in the role of Elizabeth Collins Stoddard, alongside Louis Edmonds, Catherine Lee Scott, Mitch Ryan, and, of course, Alexandra Moltke. 
We also get fun appearances from Conrad Baines as the hotel clerk, Mr. Wells, who you'll probably remember from different strokes, and Elizabeth Wilson as Mrs. Hopewell, who you most likely have seen in the Adams Family movie from 1991. Jane Rose portrayed Mrs. Mitchell in just this one episode, but you may remember her as Audrey Dexter and Phyllis, the first Mary Tyler Moore spinoff. Dark Shadows ended up replacing Never Too Young, another soap opera which only lasted about 192 episodes, and starred Tony Dow from Leave it to Beaver fame. I watched some of the pilot for Never Too Young, and, uh, well, based on what I saw, I'm not surprised it was cancelled. But I know some people were disappointed. I was actually scrolling through the YouTube comments and somebody wrote their comment and said that they were such a fan of that soap opera and Tony Dow that they refused to watch Dark Shadows because of it, just li literally protested it. I wonder if that person ever ended up watching Dark Shadows and giving it a chance. My guess is no, though. Right from the start, Victoria is the audience's eyes and ears into the mysterious world of Collinsport. She's fascinated and yet cautious, wondering what will happen next with all of these strangers. I have to say that the pre-Barnabas days held my attention equally, if not more, compared to some of the other storylines later on. I liked the fact that Victoria was inquisitive and not only wanted to know about herself, but about the people within this town. Fans of the series would say that Barnabas was the heart and soul of the show, but it didn't start out that way. What I don't care for is that Victoria's role takes a back seat when Barnabas shows up. That inquisitive nature I love about her so much dissolves, and she becomes this sort of traditional damsel in distress that walks around saying, I don't understand, when just months prior she saved David Collins from burning in a fire with his mother the Phoenix. Even Moltke herself was tired of the role, and after she left the series to give birth to her son Adam, she told Dan Curtis, I'm only going to come back if I can play a villainess or something. Dan refused, and the fans are again left wondering, who were Vicky's parents? Both daughter and Betty Hanscom. That first year of Dark Shadows was filled with a lot of excitement for our protagonist, dealing with Roger Collins and his paranoid mind, now that Burke Devlin was back to destroy him, an angry little boy who resented her, Carolyn's jealousy over her relationship with this multi-millionaire, and Elizabeth Collins' daughter with all of her secrets. Victoria Winters was the quintessential heroine, the Jane Eyre of 1966, my favorite character of the series. And... <laughs> She got a raw deal. I intend to fix that in my fan fiction audio drama series that you can hear right here on Dark Paradise, where I will explain the true origins of... I explain the... Uh, what is that? Find me. Strange Paradise. Not just a Dark Shadows ripoff. September 8, 1969. Dark Shadows has already been on the air for a few years, in the 1897 storyline, when this other gothic soap opera enters onto the scene. While I can't disagree that Dark Shadows was inspired by Strange Paradise, calling it a direct ripoff is like saying the Munsters ripped off the Addams Family. There's room for both. And the same goes for Strange Paradise. Where Dark Shadows opens with the Victoria Winters on the train, Strange Paradise opens up on the isolated island of Mel Jardin. We see Quito, this burly mute servant, who looks a little bit like Tor Johnson. He's carrying a couple of buckets of dry ice and headed towards the Great Mansion. The protagonist of the island is multi-billionaire Jean-Paul Desmond, who has just lost his wife in childbirth. But being the rich, eccentric guy that he is, he doesn't plan on long goodbyes. He's going to place her body in a cryogenic state until there can be a cure for what took her from him. 
We are also introduced to his family retainer, Raxel, who is in fact a voodoo priestess and is centuries old. She's probably one of the most interesting characters on the show. She's loyal to Jean-Paul. She doesn't appear to be out for herself, and her main goal is to protect Jean-Paul from the evil long-deceased ancestor, Jacques Elwa de Monde, who can communicate to Jean-Paul through his painting. And this is the part where you're going to stop me and scream, well, it sounds like a Dark Shadows ripoff to me. And this is the part where I'm going to stop you and give you a quick breakdown of traditional gothic elements. Gothic stories are often set in ancient castles or mansions. They have an atmosphere of mystery and suspense. There's often some kind of a curse or prophecy. Stories of this nature often include omens, visions, supernatural or unnatural events, high, even overwrought emotion. You know, your typical soap opera acting. There's also someone in distress and an overall sense of doom and gloom. Now, if that doesn't sound like a perfect description of both of these series, I don't know what does. Dark Shadows had your vampires, ghosts, witches, occults, and Strange Paradise utilized possession, a Jekyll and Hyde personality, witches, ghosts, and voodoo. Sure, they both utilized real mansions as their exterior, Sea View and Casa Loma, respectively, and there might be some overlapping of gothic elements here and there, but I still believe Strange Paradise can stand on its own two feet. Colin Fox portrays the dual roles of Jean-Paul Desmond and Jacques Elwa de Monde. He does this with such a sense of fun, especially every time Jacques comes on the scene. Cosette Lee is Raxel, the voodoo priestess who is probably older than Jacques. While she may appear to be a Mrs. Danvers lookalike, she's a character that always keeps you guessing and wondering, who is this person and why is she so mysterious? There are other players in this pilot episode. We're introduced to Alison Carr, a doctor and the sister of Jean-Paul Desmond's dead wife, Erica, her fiancé, Dan Forrest. But things don't really get interesting until about episode three, where we're introduced to Holly Marshall, Elizabeth Marshall, her mother, and Reverend Matthew Dawson. And of course, these characters all end up on the island eventually. Like Art Wallace, Ian Martin was hired to write many of the episodes. He wrote about 44 of them before creative differences removed him from the project. Other writers were brought in, like Ron Sprout and Joe Caldwell, of all people, but we'll get to them in another episode. I don't like how Mel Jardin, that first story arc, wrapped up. Ian Martin had so many interesting ideas that never came to fruition. He went on to do some voice acting for many different roles on CBC Mystery Radio Theater, along with writing many of the episodes, even one based on Strange Paradise that he called To Die Is Forever, which was basically a condensed version of a lot of the Mel Jardin plotline. If you enjoy old-time radio theater, you really should check that one out on YouTube. However, I wouldn't recommend starting there, if you want to watch Strange Paradise from the beginning, just go to YouTube and you'll find it there. Yes, it can get a little slow. It drags on a little bit, just kind of like Dark Shadows in the early days. But, but just give it a chance. A Review Dark Shadows by Marilyn Ross For this premiere episode, it was only fitting that I discuss the first book in Marilyn Ross's book series, Dark Shadows. Many of you know Ross wrote the series under his wife's name, and the first came out in December 1966. This is a direct tie-in to the series. Great for marketing, I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, but could you buy those books in the supermarket? I'm really happy that Hermes Press has re-released these as audiobooks, mainly for people like me that have low vision, and now we can enjoy them. I actually purchased 26 of the paperback books, but since I struggle to read them with the regular print, I'm really enjoying the opportunity of listening to these audiobooks read by Catherine Lee Scott. The audiobook opens up with the classic Dark Shadows theme, and then Catherine Lee Scott takes on all these characters that everyone knows. Prota the protagonist, Victoria Winters, Elizabeth, Roger, Carolyn, and of course, Maggie Evans. Marilyn Ross gives us a parallel time version of the show we know and love. While Burke Devlin is still present, he does not become romantically attached to Victoria. That job falls to a character that never appears on the series. 
His name was Ernest Collins, and he was a violinist, shrouded in mystery. His wife had died like the year before. And of course, Victoria is trying to find out what happened with all of that, falls in love with Ernest. He falls in love with her. But on top of all of that, someone is trying to kill Victoria. I liked the fact that this novel was told from Victoria's perspective. It really gives the audience a sense of connection and also builds suspense because we're experiencing everything along with her. I'm not sure how I feel about the Ernest character. Original characters outside of the source material can be really tricky, especially when romantic establishments have already come into play on the televised series. I get that Marilyn Ross wanted to do his own thing. And I admire that. I do wish he would have been allowed to ignore the executives that told him to drop Victoria as the protagonist. See, and I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but after Victoria left the televised series, Marilyn Ross was forced to drop her as the she had been the protagonist for five book series, and then all of a sudden... The focus switches, and guess who takes the focus? Yep, Barnabas. Now, again, I have nothing against Barnabas per se, but we are talking about the pre-Barnabas days here, and it just makes me sad that this character, Victoria, that we all know and love, gets shafted in favor of this other character who starts off as evil. But more on that in another episode. If you'd like to participate and discuss Dark Shadows or Strange Paradise in the next episode, please get in touch with me either on Facebook or Twitter at Soul Twin Audios. I will be discussing the arrival of Barnabas Collins, the possession of Jean-Paul Desmond, and releasing the first episode of my Dark Paradise crossover, which begins in the year 1945. Dark Paradise is a Soul Twin Audios production, hosted by Rachel Pulliam. Ross Bernhardt composed the Dark Paradise and Soul Twin Audios themes. Miguel Sanchez performed the reimagining of the Strange Paradise theme, originally by Score Productions, Inc., with incidental music by Kevin McLeod and Storyblocks, with sound effects by freesound.org. Jerry Kokich was heard at the beginning of the episode as the train conductor. The Shadows on the Wall Bible was written by Art Wallace. The Dark Shadows trailer was based on the original pilot episode written by Art Wallace and voice acted by Diana Kennedy as Victoria Winters, Pete Lutz as Roger Collins, Rachel Pulliam as Elizabeth Collins Stoddard, Tanya Milovich as Maggie Evans, Dean T. Moody as Wilbur Strakes, and Adam Blanford as Burke Devlin. Dark Paradise is copyrighted by Soul Twin Audios Productions in 2022. Children of the night, I'm trying to read. Renfield, enter. Count Dracula. I found an especially juicy dinner for you, Master. It's not a puppy this time, is it? No, Master. I promised I had learned my lesson. <laughs> I know you did, and you've been steadfast ever since. I apologize for doubting you. Please, put it over there. Master, if I may ask, why didn't you go out hunting tonight? Why did you request takeout? It's because I'm reading a very excellent book that I just can't put down. It is quite the page-turner, as I believe the children today say. It's called Gothic Meditations at Midnight by Dr. Stephen Edred Flowers. Gothic Meditations at Midnight? Is it a forbidden grimoire of unholy rites? <laughs> no, Renfield. As its subtitle states, it contains 
Esoteric commentaries on classic horror literature and film from the year 1919, which for me was a very good year, to 1975. I don't understand, Master. Dr. Flowers is a scholar who is also a lover of horror films and literature. And he was a monster kid. You always said children were the most tasty. <laughs> Focus, Renfield. I am not drinking Dr. Flowers. I would rather consume his tasty books, like this one. Gothic Meditations at Midnight. Yes, Renfield. Gothic Meditations at Midnight. In it, he provides commentaries on his thoughts and, well, meditations. Meditations on film and literature through the lenses of the historical Gothic, from the Gothic tribes to the later artistic movement of that same name. He meditates on various esoteric and occult aspects, and with plenty of sinister fun. He even starts with an essay on me. Excellent, Master. What else did he meditate on? Plenty. There are chapters on the mummy, the wolfman, the phantom of the opera, Dr. Frankenstein and his creature, the nihilistic cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft, the psychologically interior horror of Edgar Allan Poe, a unique exploration of zombies, the horror films of German Expressionism, and quite a bit more. Each essay explores information and interpretations that are deep and dark, wondrous and mysterious, with a distinct synthesis of the scholarly and the personal. It sounds wonderful, Master. I will leave you to your book and your meal. <laughs> Thank you, Renfield. Out of curiosity, who did you capture for my dinner? An especially pompous, professional film and literature critic. <laughs> Most serendipitous, Renfield. Most serendipitous indeed. Critics. And people think vampires are parasites. Ha! Gothic Meditations at Midnight by Dr. Stephen Edred Flowers is available at SeekTheMysteries.com. That's S-E-E-K-T-H-E-M-Y-S-T-E-R-I-E-S dot -E 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 com. Or at your favorite online or brick-and-mortar bookstore. <laughs>